Few men in the long history of the British Empire won the deep respect and admiration of the entire nation as Winston Spencer Churchill did in the darkest days of World War II. From his appointment as Prime Minister in May of 1940 to his departure in 1945, Churchill inspired his allies, frustrated his enemies, and charmed Great Britain with his determination, his will, and his wit. As Prime Minister, Churchill moved himself into the secret war room offices, often sleeping there. From these secret headquarters in the middle of London, but underground and hidden from public view, he pored over classified documents, planned covert military operations, and launched clandestine political gambits. All to defeat his great enemy, Adolf Hitler. Before becoming Prime Minister, he'd been a soldier, a spy, an author, a successful politician. He was outspoken, bold, and direct. He once said, there are men of ideas and men of action, and I'm definitely a man of action. Uh, he wanted to lead Britain to victory, and he was determined to do it. To beat the Germans, Churchill turned the murky world of espionage and military deceit into an organized, fierce, and devastating weapon of war. From his secret office in the Cabinet War Room, he would direct some of the most fascinating, ingenious, and devastating covert missions of the war. He used secret information to challenge the enemy in battle, to attack behind the front lines, and to manipulate Britain's allies. Part of the reason, I suspect, why Churchill was so interested in intelligence, and on the whole so good at using it, was that it was such fun. From the moment that Churchill found something interesting, he was enthused by it. And one of the things that enthused him was danger. He said at one point that there are few thrills in life quite so exciting as, and I quote, being shot out without result. In other words, you know, the man misses. Well, I mean, that really is the kind of excitement that uh, most of us can, uh, can do without, but Churchill loved it. But for all his success, he'd experienced many setbacks in his long career. Churchill had suffered humiliating mistakes with military intelligence that would have brought most careers to an end. But through it all, he learned and grew. And as the threat of World War II approached, he was ready for action. Ready to lead his nation to victory, and ready to wage an all-out secret war against the Germans. Early in his life, he'd had plenty to inspire him. His father, Randolph Churchill, was a descendant of the Duke of Marlborough, himself a celebrated war hero. Controversial and outspoken, Randolph Churchill's career burned bright, but fizzled as poor health and political enemies devastated his ambitions. Randolph died when Winston was just 20. His peers regarded him as a man whose great potential went unrealized. Churchill was an average student. The man who would one day receive the Nobel Prize for Literature earned only passing marks in grammar and reading. But he possessed a quick mind and a hunger for knowledge, even if his early teachers weren't impressed with his ability. He had not been to uh, one of the big English universities. He was neither an Oxford man nor was he a Cambridge man. He'd gone to Sandhurst instead because he was too stupid to go to one of the universities. He was self-taught in many respects. Churchill's fascination with secret war was a direct result of his own experience. At 21, he joined the military. In 1899, after serving briefly in Cairo, Churchill was sent to South Africa. The Boers were fighting Britain for their independence. Churchill was a commissioned officer and also a member of the press corps. He landed in Cape Town and, wanting to be close to the action, jumped aboard a train heading north behind enemy lines. I think there's one episode in his early life that's very relevant to his fascination with secret warfare and uh, behind enemy lines activity. He was captured by the Boers and made a prisoner of war. He then made a dramatic escape 
and for several days uh, had to survive behind Boer lines as a fugitive. Back home, the newspapers followed his daring escape. Churchill had scaled the walls of the prison. Without maps, a compass, or any knowledge of the Boer language, Churchill traveled over 300 miles behind enemy lines from Pretoria to the Portuguese-controlled border. While the Boers launched a nationwide manhunt, Churchill secretly made his way by train at night. Once home, he became a genuine war hero. From that experience, he could always say in the future, when it came to discussing secret agents behind enemy lines, I have been there too. I was once behind enemy lines. I know what it's like. And I think he relished this. And he took those memories of his sort of glorious youth, youthful escapade and adventure, into uh, his later experience as war leader. Churchill's wartime exploits made him a popular speaker back home and gave him a political platform on which he could run for parliament. Elected to his first public office in 1900, Churchill quickly gained a reputation as an up-and-coming talent whose ability to stir controversy with sarcasm and invective was matched only by his charm. His wit soon became legendary. Once Lady Astor criticized him for the amount of alcohol he drank. She told him that if she were his wife, she'd poison his drink, to which he replied, Madam, if I were your husband, I'd drink it. On another occasion, Churchill was heard to comment of a colleague he thought particularly arrogant. There, but for the grace of God, goes God. But there was one subject he was deadly serious about, Britain's need for adequate security. To Churchill, secret information gathering was the key to military success. In 1909, when he was 35, Britain's Secret Service was formally organized and made operational. No one in Whitehall was as interested in or as involved with the new military intelligence unit as was Winston Churchill. He knew about the creation of what was then called the Secret Service Bureau. And in fact, uh, we now have documents that reveal that within a matter of weeks, Churchill is talking directly to those running the Secret Service Bureau about espionage matters. By 1911, Churchill's political talent earned him a cabinet post. But it was during the First World War that Churchill learned about the possibilities and limitations of secret information. When war broke out, Britain was decoding uh, German messages, naval messages, but they really needed to centralize the effort and to bring experts together to work on it full-time in a concentrated way. Churchill created Room 40, a special place to decode, organize, and disseminate naval intelligence. Churchill's effort improved the use of this information, but secret intelligence was rarely shared between the Army and the Navy, creating the potential for mistakes and misuse. In fact, the misuse of intelligence led to one of the greatest disappointments of Churchill's career. In 1914, in the midst of the bloodiest fighting of World War I, a plan was launched to bring the war to a swift end. The Balkans were considered by military planners to be the back door to Europe. Churchill and others thought that it was an area of weakness and vulnerability for the Germans. In fact, he would one day refer to it as the soft underbelly of Europe. It was a bold and daring secret plan. British ships would sneak into the Dardanelles Strait, separating Asia Minor and Turkey, hammer the coast at Cape Helles, and take Constantinople, the capital of Turkey. But the British underestimated the coastal defenses. And when the battleships failed to succeed, troops were sent in to finish the job. Over the course of a year, the operation turned into a quagmire. 
Five of the nine battleships were destroyed and thousands of British soldiers lost their lives. It turned out to be bloodbath. The intelligence about Turkish uh, armament or Turkish uh, fortifications in the Dardanelles was very badly wrong and terribly outdated. And this was, in fact, uh, amongst other things, a, a very bad failure of intelligence. Considered one of the chief organizers of the plan, Churchill was viciously attacked by his adversaries and abandoned by many of his supporters. His political career appeared to be all but over. A darkness descended upon Churchill that would haunt him for years. Churchill often suffered, I think, from what he called his black dog, which I think we would now describe as a kind of manic depressive state. Um, one reason he didn't like introspection and introspective novels was that he was essentially a man of action, and if he stopped for too long, I think you know, what he called his black dog could overwhelm him. So he liked to keep busy. Churchill traded his place in the political line of fire for a place in the front line of the war. At the age of 40, he asked for and received a commission to lead troops. After witnessing fierce action at the front, he returned home, newly invigorated. By the early 1930s, Churchill began warning the nation about the growing threat of fascism. But the question remained, would anyone ever again listen to Winston Churchill? In the 1930s, as Adolf Hitler was beginning his rise to power, Winston Churchill was a political outsider. He made his living writing, but he longed to be at the center of political events, at the center of the action. Churchill referred to the 1930s as his wilderness years. It was the only decade of the 20th century in which Winston Churchill uh, was not in office. Churchill appeared to be rather out of date and rather right wing by the 30s. It was during this period that Churchill made what he would later view as a great blunder with secret information. He precisely revealed in his World War I memoirs how the British had broken the German codes and used the information to win the war. It would prove to be a grave mistake that alerted the Nazis to the need for tougher encryption. By 1935, despite the fact that he held no office, Churchill spoke in public, warning of the growing strength of the German military, declaiming the weaknesses of the British forces and criticizing Prime Minister Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. Many people believed his uh, future was behind him, that he was burned out, that he was finished. But he ran his campaign, increasingly vociferous campaign, against appeasement and for the rearmament of Britain against Hitler. By the mid-1930s, Churchill had already begun his secret war against Hitler. He surprised those in the know with his accurate assessment of Germany's accelerating rearmament. Few in high places knew where Churchill got such precise information about the German military buildup. In fact, he had a secret source high up in the British intelligence his close friend and confidant, Desmond Morton. I think that you would characterize it as a straightforward and quite disgraceful patriotic leak. Desmond Morton had access to all the current appreciations of German strengths. He had access to all this information and he was passing it uh, straight to Churchill. Churchill's insistent cries were ignored at first. In the 1930s, a nation determined to avoid repeating the horrors of World War I viewed Churchill as an alarmist. But as Hitler built his military into a juggernaut and as the German nation began to grind inexorably towards European conquest, it was Britain's tune that quickly changed. Suddenly, Churchill was no longer a doomsayer. Winston Churchill was a prophet perhaps even a savior. When Hitler invaded Poland in September 1939, Churchill was transformed from presumed warmonger to war leader. He returned as first Lord of the Admiralty, the office he had left in disgrace over a decade earlier. 
but a higher office awaited the man who had been among the first to warn the nation of the German threat. I think it helps to think of Winston Churchill as a sort of stopped clock, a pocket watch that had a ground to a halt somewhere in the early years of the 20th century. For most of the 20s and 30s, he is out of place. But suddenly, in 1940, he's telling the right time again. In May of 1940, the nation learned that Chamberlain the Dove was out and Churchill the Lion would lead them. The king invited Churchill to Buckingham Palace and conveyed by tradition what Churchill's party had already decided by ballot. Churchill would become the next prime minister. As he would later say, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. As Churchill moved into the official residence of the Prime Minister at 10 Downing Street, he faced a crisis of epic proportions. Well, what faces Churchill the day he becomes Prime Minister is impending disaster. Because the day he becomes Prime Minister, the Germans attack with the massed forces of Wehrmacht in Western Europe. Great Britain faced the Nazi war machine alone. Within a matter of weeks, France is defeated. France is out of the war. France is Britain's greatest ally, indeed only ally. As the bombs dropped in the summer of 1940, Churchill faced the challenge by inspiring the British people to stand firm. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. Privately, he gathered a secret group of advisors to fight with the one weapon Britain had at its disposal, secret information. A mansion called Bletchley Park outside of London had been purchased by MI6, the foreign affairs section of the British Secret Service, during the First World War. At Bletchley Park, experts worked to decode German communications. By the Second World War, the organization was successfully reading many of the German radio messages. The decrypts would be dubbed Ultra by Churchill for their ultra-secret content. Britain's greatest war leader becomes Prime Minister at the very moment when the greatest intelligence in the history of warfare comes on stream. Stuart Mengus was the man charged with providing Churchill with his intelligence updates each day. Mengus was an experienced information officer and the head of MI6. Early in the war, Mengus and Churchill worked out a routine. Mengus would carefully select the most important decrypts from the large number that came in daily, put them into a big suitcase, and personally bring them to Churchill for his review. Often Churchill was still in bed or lounging in his bathtub. Churchill's relationship with Mengus uh, was an interesting one. He regarded Mengus as the man who brought him the goose that laid the golden eggs. The only time he was really cross with him was on the occasion when they tried to send him digests of the decrypts. He wanted the detail. He wanted the raw data. Churchill learned the lessons of intelligence that had been misapplied in World War I with the invasion of the Dardanelles. It was a mistake he didn't intend to repeat. Churchill wasn't happy just to see the summaries which would be prepared and processed by the Secret Intelligence Service. He loved the nitty-gritty. He actually liked to see the direct intercept, so that's the flimsy that is prepared directly from the translation. Churchill always wanted to be at the center of the action. He often traveled to the front lines to visit the troops and plan with his generals. But in the beginning, Churchill still made mistakes. The raw intelligence was often like a puzzle. In some cases, Churchill got the picture wrong. 
One time was the battle in North Africa where the British faced the indefatigable German general Erwin Rommel. Churchill would receive Rommel's messages to Hitler requesting more tanks and assume the embattled enemy was ripe for attack when in fact the opposite was true. As soon as he read a decrypted German telegram, he would telegraph off to his two commanders at the time and say, look, Rommel says he's got no tanks left. Attack now. Well, of course, Rommel did have some tanks left, but he knew the only way to get some more tanks out of Hitler was to say that he really didn't uh, have any left. And, uh, you know, Churchill interfering at that kind of micromanagement level didn't work. Over the course of the war, Churchill learned to use secret intelligence more carefully. And he learned to trust commanders like Bernard Montgomery to use the information for maximum tactical advantage. If you're looking for an example of um, a military confrontation, a battle, that the outcome was changed decisively as a direct consequence of the use of Ultra, then you can do no better than El Alamein. Precise information about where the Germans were and where they intended to attack gave Montgomery an important tactical advantage. In the period after the Second World War, Montgomery was regarded as a genius, as a military strategist. We now know that through uh, Bletchley Park, um, he had a comprehensive understanding of the enemy's order of battle, of its reserves, of its fuel supplies, of its locations, and its future intentions. Any military commander going into battle with that kind of information should have to have an awful lot of excuses if he's going to lose. As the battle raged on in the desert, Churchill also struggled with the Battle of the Atlantic, where code-breaking played a crucial role. In the longest-running battle of the war, ultra-decrypts of the German naval Enigma code would prove decisive in locating the dangerous U-boat submarines. One thing that he enjoyed more than anything else was to be able to pull a rabbit out of the hat at war cabinet and disclose an item of information that appeared to display astonishing prescience. Of course, it was based on secret intelligence that only he was privy to. Churchill relied on secret information coming out of Bletchley Park to stay ahead of the enemy. But secret information alone couldn't win the war. Britain needed to attack Germany with weapons, not just words. But she had few military resources to wage battle. Churchill's solution was to meet the challenge with stealth and cunning. Britain would create an army of resistance fighters train them in Britain and drop them behind enemy lines to wreak havoc. In 1940, Churchill created the Special Operations Executive, or SOE. They would be freedom fighters who would take the battle behind enemy lines. The creation of this organization to engender resistance within occupied Europe was actually a, a very useful defensive tool. Um, by creating resistance, it was hoped uh, that the German forces would be distracted, that they would, uh, they would have other things to worry about other than focusing solely on the invasion of the United Kingdom. As the winter of 1941 gave way to spring, Churchill wanted daily updates he stayed in touch with top commanders in the field. In the beginning, Churchill's strategy was to ensure Britain's survival. Once that was accomplished, the goal became victory over Germany. But Britain couldn't take back the continent alone. For this, Churchill would have to build a grand alliance, and secret information would be one of the tools necessary for its success. In the first year of the war, Churchill had relied on secret information and covert operations to frustrate the Germans and achieve battlefield success. But a clear-cut victory required one more important element, 
taking Europe back from the Germans with military strength. Churchill knew from Britain's past that a cloak of secrecy would be required to ensure that she had a future. There is no question that uh, Churchill often found a lot of his inspiration in the past. Uh, he was a historian and, and clearly knew about grand, the importance of grand alliances. For Churchill to fulfill the dream of a liberated Europe, he would have to create a strong alliance of powerful states. Secret information played a critical role both in creating and in holding together the Grand Alliance. Churchill, the avowed anti-communist, had to make a Faustian choice. Either ally with a longtime enemy, Joseph Stalin, or fight Germany alone. His decision was quick and clear. When asked why he would support a country he'd so often criticized and condemned, Churchill replied, if Hitler invaded hell, I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. Just as he had shared secret information with Roosevelt, Churchill used intelligence from Bletchley Park to warn Joseph Stalin of Hitler's impending invasion of the Soviet Union. The German codename for the invasion was Barbarossa. As soon as Hitler began moving troops east, the British codebreakers knew about it. As a result, an urgent telegram was sent to Stalin warning him of the imminent invasion. Unbelievably, instead of seizing on this important information, Stalin rejected it. Stalin, with supreme pig-headedness, consistently refused to acknowledge this. Uh, not merely did he reject the intelligence being offered by, by the British, but he, but he consistently rejected intelligence being provided by his own intelligence services. But if secret intelligence was of little use with Joseph Stalin, it was much more useful to Britain's true ally, the United States. He tried to think of everything that he could of binding together Britain and the United States. And one of the ways that he thought of, even before the United States comes into the war, even before Pearl Harbor, was by sharing with Roosevelt the biggest secret in British history. In 1940, Churchill told Roosevelt about Ultra, the name given to the codes coming out of Bletchley Park. Roosevelt understood the significance of Britain's code breaking. What he did not know is that the British were also listening in on America. The biggest secret that Churchill keeps from Roosevelt before Pearl Harbor is that Britain is not simply breaking German codes. Britain is also breaking American codes, which were far easier to break. Churchill has a real sense of responsibility to the special relationship. So the big change that comes about after Pearl Harbor is that Churchill orders that Britain will no longer break American codes. From the beginning, Roosevelt was on Britain's side, but American isolationists were a powerful lobby. But lasting memories of lost fathers in the blood-soaked trenches of World War I convinced many in the next American generation to avoid meddling in foreign affairs. England is hanging on a thread in 1940-41. So Churchill's extremely interested in U.S. politics. U.S. politics will determine whether Britain wins or loses this war. In 1940, a British Secret Service agent, William Stevenson, arrived in New York City. He set up offices in Rockefeller Center and worked under the cover of an organization called the British Security Coordination, or BSC. The BSC's mission was to turn American public opinion in favor of the British. Using methods later known as dirty tricks, it rigged public opinion polls, manipulated and bribed politicians, and compromised many who opposed American involvement in the war. Churchill knew about Stevenson's assignment, and he approved. But when it came to propaganda, Churchill believed that actions could speak louder than words. Winston Churchill's propaganda strategy is clever. The first principle is that he thinks that the best propaganda is deeds. 
But whenever anybody suggested to him, Mr. Churchill, we need better propaganda in America, he would say, if we beat the Germans here, we'll need no propaganda in America. Always, that was what he wanted to do. Beat the Germans and impress the Americans that way. He used secret intelligence not only for the battlefield, but for the political arena as well. When decrypts of German communiques revealed that Hitler would not invade Britain in 1940, Churchill did not share the information with his friends in the United States. He withholds it because the threat of a German invasion of Britain is an absolutely vital element in persuading Roosevelt and the Americans that the British must be supported. Between the wars, Churchill had spent many free hours building the family house at Chartwell. Building a brick wall was no different in essence from building a coalition. Each had to be built one brick at a time. To Churchill, America would have to be led very carefully into the conflict. He felt strongly that direct American military involvement would be necessary to defeat the Axis powers. But when he visited the American Congress in 1941, he softened his appeal and broadened his base of support by asking only for equipment and arms. When Churchill did speak directly to the Americans, he lied. I think his biggest lie comes in early 1941 when he says, give us the tools and we will finish the job. Now he says this knowing that ever since the previous September, September 1940, the British cabinet had had as its policy, as its accepted doctrine, the war could not be won without American uh, military support. All Churchill could do was fight a holding action until the Americans came in. If Churchill misled the public, he was bold and direct with Franklin Roosevelt. The two men spent hours discussing war strategy. Both were serious men, but both found humor and friendship in the other's company during some of the most troubled moments of the war. There's the famous story of Roosevelt, who of course was disabled and uh, who had to have a, an automobile specially modified so he could drive it, greeting Churchill and saying, get in, I'll take you for a ride. And he set off rather wildly towards the bluffs overlooking the Hudson River and only narrowly managed to avoid plunging over these bluffs. And Churchill made some crack about this, about, you know, this is one of the greatest perils he ever faced in the Second World War, was being driven by Roosevelt around the Hyde Park estate in New York. Politics was a frequent topic discussed between the two leaders. Churchill had secret information about the enemy, but he also had secret information about Allied generals. Douglas MacArthur was the ingenious commander whose uncertain military and political plans were both alarming and threatening. This is not a story that's terribly well known, but Churchill was extremely concerned about any potential threat from Douglas MacArthur because, of course, it was widely rumored that MacArthur would stand as a Republican against Roosevelt in the 1944 election. Churchill would have been in despair had Roosevelt been removed from the scene. Through 1942 and 1943, he did have a, a man of his own at MacArthur's Pacific War headquarters, a secret intelligence service agent who was reporting back to him about MacArthur. Mostly he was passing on information to Churchill about MacArthur's political intentions and trying to help Churchill get a better fix on MacArthur and the political threat this man posed to Roosevelt. An exhaustive travel schedule, late-night conferences, and exposure to the elements all took their toll. As Roosevelt's guest at the White House, Churchill experienced the first of many threats to his health during the war. One of the greatest secrets of the Second World War occurred uh, over Churchill's health and was kept secret from Churchill himself. During his first visit to the White House in December 1941, one evening, he found the room uh, rather warm and he pushed open the window, tried to push open the window, and in doing so, suffered a slight heart attack. Uh, he called in his personal physician, Lord Moran, and he said, Charles, uh, I've got this sort of pain in my chest, and what is it? Moran very quickly came to appreciate that there had been a mild heart attack and that he was not going to tell Churchill. 
He did not want to frighten the Prime Minister. So he said something like, well, you've been working a little bit hard, Mr. Prime Minister, perhaps you should take it easy for a few days. But Churchill took very little time to rest. It took all the energy he had to keep the alliance between the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union together and focused on beating Hitler. In the first few years of the war, the strategy had been simply to survive, but with the alliance in place, the goal became victory. By 1943, the Allies were preparing for one of the greatest undertakings of the war, and secret information and covert operations were a vital aspect of Allied plans. By 1943, plans were being made ready for Operation Overlord, the code name for the Allied invasion that would come to be known as D-Day. Dwight Eisenhower was the American general chosen to coordinate and lead the effort. There was little doubt where he stood on the issue of British secret intelligence. When Eisenhower came over initially as commander of American forces in Europe, he was briefed on ultra personally by Winston Churchill at Chequers, the country house of British Prime Minister. And Eisenhower's mind was blown. He did something at that moment which no American general had ever done before, and I suspect that no American general has done since. He said, not merely, I want this. He said, I want my chief of intelligence to be a British officer. At the center of the planning for the invasion sat Winston Churchill. Churchill knew from history and his own experience about the efficacy of surprise in war. The Germans were expecting the Allied forces to attack at the Pas de Calais, the closest point between France and Great Britain. One of the great problems with D-Day is how do you keep it a surprise? Uh, you're having to gather a great amphibious army, equipment, it's all going to have to cross the channel. There are only a number of places it can go. And this, of course, is where uh, um, secret intelligence comes in very handy. Secret information was used in various ways to mislead the Germans, from false radio broadcasts to misleading reports of troop movements. In addition to the challenges of secrecy, the invasion presented major technical challenges if it was to truly surprise the Germans. Churchill was a, a great man for gadgets. Uh, he had a real interest in technology, even though he had no scientific background or training. Sometimes this went very wrong. The wrong one one can think of here is in 1943, when he was obsessed with the idea of having ships disguised as floating icebergs. But when it came to D-Day, his ideas had more success. Churchill personally helped solve some of the most important logistical problems that the Allies faced. One of the great problems in planning D-Day is how you're going to supply the Allied forces when they get there with petroleum. The obvious means would have been tankers, but tankers loaded with fuel would be sitting targets for the Germans. Churchill came up with the answer of how to find enough petrol for the Allied forces when they landed, so-called Pluto. Churchill understood that technical advances in metallurgy made it possible to create a pipeline that spanned the English Channel. In 1943, work began to manufacture the materials necessary to carry out the top secret project, codenamed Pluto. It was a daring plan to supply the Allied landing force with a never-ending supply of fuel that could not be bombed by the Germans. But a pipeline only solved half of the problem. The other half was finding a place for the ships to dock. Churchill came up with answers for both. What you created, first of all, were these artificial floating harbors, mulberry harbors, uh, which would allow you to unload heavy equipment, and pipelines under the ocean, which would allow you to supply the petroleum without the risk of the Nazis being able to blow it all up. 
For all the secret plans, one essential component at the heart of the D-Day invasion was intelligence. The operation would stand or fall upon the Allies' ability to monitor the movements and the plans of the enemy. The great system of deception which makes D-Day possible would have been impossible without Ultra because without the ability to work out how much the deception was working, you couldn't have done that without reading the, the German ciphers. Intelligence had helped Great Britain survive, and it was clearly a key component in the planning for D-Day. But secret information also revealed other problems, problems that had to do not with Britain's enemy, but with her French ally, Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle, never popularly elected in France, had nonetheless become the French leader representing resistance against the German occupier. Living in London, de Gaulle spent as much of his time building his own power base as he did fighting the Germans. Churchill's relationship with General de Gaulle is rather like that of Dr. Frankenstein with his monster. Uh, Churchill created him and could not control him. By 1943, American intelligence was also keeping tabs on de Gaulle. One of the things they learned was that de Gaulle's methods for acquiring his secret information were in a civilized democracy less than savory. One of the things that the Americans reveal, which is actually something that uh, the British Secret Intelligence Service already knew, is that in de Gaulle's secret police headquarters in King Street in London, there are reports of torture that people who've come out of France claiming to be free Frenchmen who are suspect are actually taken down to the cellars of King Street and some very unpleasant things happen to them. Churchill confronted de Gaulle and demanded that his interrogations stop. For a time they did. But throughout the war, Churchill was repeatedly frustrated by de Gaulle's behavior. Despite the enormous logistic and political problems, the Allies were ready to attempt the cross-channel invasion by 1944. There was no guarantee that D-Day would be a success. Churchill was so anxious about the impending invasion that he wanted to be there when the troops landed. Churchill actually wanted to go on D-Day. Churchill actually wanted to be there with the landings and wanted to go ashore. Not quite in the first wave, although I'm sure that uh, he had fantasies about that. The only way they could find to stop him was the king said, well, he wanted to go. And Churchill said, no, your majesty's uh, safety is far too important. And the king was then able to use that to blackmail Churchill into staying and saying, well, if I can't go and you go, it makes me look like a coward. So Churchill, of course, had to stay at home as well. As D-Day began, Churchill closely followed the decrypts coming out of Bletchley Park. He was anxious to know of any success and worried about the possibility of failure. But Churchill had approved a secret plan, one that would serve as a backup if the invasion failed and the war was prolonged. We now know that Operation Foxley, a plan to assassinate Adolf Hitler, was approved by Churchill in the summer of 1944. Now, in the end, it never took place for all kinds of uh, obscure and complex reasons. One of the arguments that was used by some people who were opposed to this plan, who said the worst thing we could do is kill Hitler, because Hitler is driving Germany into destruction, so why should we take away the man who's doing it for us? The success of D-Day made it clear that the Germans could be beaten. The organization and high standards Churchill established had paid off. But just as the threat from Hitler seemed to be contained, new problems appeared on the horizon. The Soviets, once an ally, were becoming the new enemy. The success of D-Day in June of 1944 and the growing inevitability of Germany's defeat presented new problems for Churchill and Roosevelt. 
Churchill had always viewed Stalin as a temporary ally, a man to be feared, watched, and where possible thwarted. For his part, Stalin was certain that the West would destroy the Soviets if given the opportunity. Stalin, like Churchill, worked to obtain secret information about his enemies and his allies. Marshal Stalin's paranoia knew no bounds. Determined to uncover the plot against him by the West, he ordered his secret intelligence service, the NKVD, to learn all it could about American and British post-war plans. At conferences designed to plan joint military strategy, Stalin took the opportunity to spy. At Yalta, in the Crimea, the old Tsar's palaces, in which the British and the American delegations are staying, are 100% bugged uh, by the Russians. Stalin has transcripts provided of what's going on in, in every room. It probably redounded to Britain's advantage because all that Stalin and the Russians would have heard both at Tehran and Yalta was just how determined Churchill was to carry on fighting the war. When the war ended in 1945, Churchill became increasingly concerned that the grand alliance he had carefully built was beginning to crack. By early 1946, he's becoming convinced of two things. First of all, that cooperation with the Soviets is not working. And secondly, that America and Britain are in danger of drifting apart, which, given the fact that the Soviets probably can't be trusted, is a great danger, the greatest danger, he thinks, to world peace. In March 1946, at Westminster College, Fulton, Missouri, he takes the opportunity not just to give the usual address at graduation, but to give, as he sees it, an important warning to the world. Winston Churchill. It was one of the most famous speeches of his career, and in it he created a metaphor that would stand as a symbol of the division between East and West. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line, by all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Winston Churchill had almost single-handedly changed the way wars were fought. By institutionalizing secret warfare, he made it one of the most powerful weapons of all future wars. Churchill didn't use intelligence perfectly. But he did use it clearly better than any politician in any country had ever used it before during the Second World War. And I think the two reasons. First, he had longer experience. He'd been a British spy in the Boer War at the beginning of the century. He'd been a member of the cabinet, which in 1909 had set up the British Foreign Intelligence Service, MI6, as the minister in charge of the Royal Navy, First Lord of the Admiralty at the beginning of the First World War. He'd presided over the rebirth of British coat banking. Ironically, at the end of the war, Churchill was forced out of office. The nation was grateful, but it was also ready for change, for a new beginning. Churchill, the statesman, retired. He would return again in 1951, but his finest hour had passed. In the years after the war, he returned to his favorite hobby, painting. Today he stands as an example of how the indomitable spirit of man can transcend the ephemeral evils of any given time or place. Churchill's legacies is as an example of what a war leader in a democracy ought to be. It's difficult now to remember just how difficult it was for leaders before Churchill as civilians to get a handle on wartime planning. Churchill's constant attention to detail, Churchill's dominance because of his attention to detail and his mastery of secret intelligence over the military, I think really have provided almost a template that every Western leader since has tried to live up to. You can look at the Gulf War, you can look at the war in Kosovo, and on each occasion the uh, British leaders, the American leaders, have at least tried to strike a Churchillian pose. When the war ended, 
Churchill remembered the harsh lessons he learned after the First World War when he'd written about Britain's success in breaking the German code. At the end of his life, he held many of the secrets of the Second World War and fully endorsed the Official Secrets Act, which required strict confidentiality about past wartime activities. Many of the most fascinating secrets of the war are only now becoming public. Many are yet to be discovered, and some, perhaps more than we will ever know, died with the man who led his nation to victory in democracy's finest hour.